Come, all you good people who would hear a song Of men bold, of men brave, of men weak, of men strong Of a king who was mighty but wild as a boy And list to the ballad of Harry Laroy Of a king who was mighty but wild as a boy and list to the ballad of Harry Leroy. Thirteen ninety and eight is the year we begin. King Richard the second, the reign we are in. Two lords fought a duel, one ill-fated day. Henry Bolingbroke of Lancaster, Thomas Mowbray. Both mounted with lances on fire for the fight. Their horses aflame, brave night against night. Stop the joust, cried King Richard, at the very last breath. Henceforth you're both exiled upon pain of death. How a king who was mighty but wild as a boy, and list to the ballad of Harry Leroy. One year passes by, Henry Bolingbroke returns At the head of an army, for vengeance he burns Defeats and imprisons King Richard alone Then murders him shamefully, seizes the throne Of a king who was mighty but wild as a boy And lives to the ballad of Harry Leroy of a king who was mighty but wild as a boy And lifts to the ballad of Harry Leroy Of a king who was mighty but wild as a boy And lifts to the ballad of Harry Leroy So shaken as we are, so worn with care, find we a time for frighted peace to pant, and breathe short-winded accents of new broils to be commenced in strands of far remote. No more the thirsty entrance of this soil shall daub her lips with her own children's blood. No more shall trenching war channel her fields, nor bruise her flowerets with the armed hooves of hostile paces and those opposed eyes which like the meteors of a troubled heaven did lately meet in the intestine shock and furious close of civil butchery shall now in mutual well-beseeming ranks march all one way and be no more opposed against acquaintance kindred and allies the edge of war like an ill-sheathed knife. No more shall cut his master. Therefore, friends, as far as to the sepulchre of Christ, forthwith the power of English shall be levied. To chase these pagans in those holy fields, over whose acres walked those blessed feet, which fourteen hundred years ago were nailed for our advantage on the bitter cross. But this our purpose now is twelve months old. Bootless is to tell you we will go. Wherefore we meet not now. Then let me hear of you, my gentle cousin Westmoreland, what yesternight our council did decree in forwarding this dear expedient. My liege, this haste was hot in question but yesternight, and all athwart there came a post from Wales, loaden with heavy news, whose worst was that the noble Mortimer leading the men of Herefordshire to fight against the irregular and wild Glendower, was by the rude hands of that Welshman taken. A thousand of his people butchered, upon whose dead corpse there was such misuse, such beastly, shameless transformation by those Welsh women done, as may not be without much shame retold or spoken of. It seems, then, that the tidings of this broil break off our business for the Holy Land. This, matched with other, did my noble lord. For more uneven and unwelcome news came from the north, and thus it did import. On Holyrood Day, the gallant Hotspur there, 
young Harry Percy, at home done against the Earl of Douglas. Here is a dear, a true, industrious friend, Sir Walter Blunt, with smooth and welcome news. The Earl of Douglas is discomforted. <laughs> Ten thousand bold Scots, two and twenty knights, balked in their own blood, did myself see on Holmden's plains. Of prisoners, Hotspur took Mordake, Earl of Fife, and eldest son to Beaton Douglas, and the Earl of Athol, of Murray, Angus, and Menteith. And is not this an honourable spoil, a gallant prize, eh, cousin, is it not? In faith, it is a conquest for a prince to boast of. What think you, cause of this young Percy's pride? The prisoners which he in this adventure hath surprised, for his own use he keeps and sends me word, I shall have none but more to call a fight. This is his uncle's teaching. This is Worcester. Malevolent to you in all aspects that makes him prune himself and bristle up the crest of youth against your dignity. I will send for him to answer this. And for this cause a while we must neglect our holy purpose to Jerusalem. Cousin, on Wednesday next our council we will hold at Windsor, so inform the lords. But come yourself with speed to us again. For more is to be said and to be done than out of anger can be uttered. I will, my lord. Can no man tell me of my unthrifty son? It is full three months since I did see him last. I would to God, my lord, he could be found. Inquired at London at the taverns there. But there, they say, he daily doth frequent with unrestrained loose companions. Even such, they say, as stand in narrow lanes and beat or watch and rob our passengers. Whilst he, young wanton and effeminate boy, Takes on the point of honor to support so dissolute a crew. Time of day is it, lad? Thou art so fat-witted with drinking of old sack and unbuttoning the after supper and sleeping upon benches afternoon that thou hast forgotten to demand that truly which thou wouldst truly know. What a devil hast thou to do with the time of the day? Unless ours were cups of sack and minutes, capons and clocks, the tongues of boards and the blessed sun himself, a fair hot wench in flame-coloured taffeta, I see no reason why thou shouldst be so superfluous as to demand the time of the day. Indeed, you come near me now, lad. For we that take purses go by the moon and the seven stars, and not by Phoebus he, that wandering knight so fair. And I pray thee, sweet wag, when thou art king, let not us that are squires of the knight's body be called thieves of the day's beauty. Let us be Diana's foresters, gentlemen of the shade, minions of the moon, and let men say we be men of good government, being governed as the sea is by that noble and chaste mistress, the moon, under whose countenance we steal. Mm, I say as well, and it holds well, too, for the fortune of us that are the moon's men doth ebb and blow like the sea, being governed as the sea is by the moon. Now in as low an ebb as the foot of the ladder, by and by in as high a flow as the ridge of the gallows. By the Lord, let thou see us true there. But is not mine hostess of the tavern a most sweet wench? Why, what a pox have I to do with mine hostess of the tavern? 
Well, thou hast called into a reckoning many a time and oft. Did I ever call for thee to pay thy part? No, I'll give thee thy due. Thou hast paid all there. Nay, and elsewhere, as far as my coin would stretch, and where it would not, I've used my credit. Yea, and so used it, that were it not here apparent that thou art heir apparent. <laughs> but I pray thee, sweet wag, shall there be gallows standing in England when thou art king? Ah. Do not, when thou art king, hang a thief. No, thou shalt. Shall I? Oh, rare. Oh, by the Lord, thou be a brave judge. No, no, thou judgest but... false already. I mean thou shalt have the hanging of the thieves and so become a rare hangman. Well, Hal, well. In some sort it jumps with my humor. Blood, I'm as melancholy as a jib cat. Or a lug bear. <coughs> or an old lion. Or a lover's lute. Yea, or the drone of a Lincolnshire bagpipe. <laughs> what sayest thou to the melancholy of Moorditch? Thou hast the most unsavory similes. <laughs> but I prithee, how trouble me no more with vanity. I would to God thou and I knew where a commodity of good names would have been bought. <laughs> An old lord of the council rated me in the street about you the other day, and I marked him not, and yet he spoke wisely, and I regarded him not, and yet he spoke wisely, and in the street too. How didst well, for wisdom cries out in the street, and no man regards it. Thou hast damnable iteration, and art able to corrupt a saint. Uh. Thou hast done much harm upon me, Hal. God forgive me for it. Before I knew thee, I knew nothing. And now, if a man may speak truly, I am little better than one of the wicked. I must give over this life. <laughs> I will give it over. And I do not, I am a villain. I'll be damned for never a king's son in Christendom. Where shall we take our purse tomorrow, Jack? Soon, lad, where thou wilt, I'll make one. And I do not. Call me a villain and baffle me. Oh, I see a good amendment of life in thee from praying to purse taking. Why, how tis my vocation? Tis no sin, Hal, for a man to labor at his vocation. <laughs> Coins! Now shall we see if Gads Hill have set a match. Ah, hey, good morrow, sweet How? Oh, good morrow, there. Good morrow, good morrow, good morrow. <laughs> oh, what says oh. Monsieur Ramos? What says Sir John Sack and Sugar? Mwah! Hey, Jack. How agrees the devil and thyself about thy soul, which thou soldst him on Good Friday last, for a cup of Madeira and a cold capon's leg. Sir John keeps to his word, the devil shall have his bargain. <laughs> but lads, lads, tomorrow morning, by four o'clock early at Gads Hill, there are pilgrims going to Canterbury with rich offerings and traders riding to London with fat purses. I have visors for you all. You have horses for yourselves. Nick Gads Hill lies tonight at Rochester. I have bespoke supper tomorrow night at East Jeep. We may do it as secure as sleep. If you'll go, I'll stuff your purses full of crowns. If not, well, tarry at home and be hanged. Hear ye, but if I tarry at home and go not, I'll hang ye for going. You will, Chubbs. Well, how will I make one? Do I rob? <laughs> I, a thief, not I, by my faith. Yeah. There's neither honesty in manhood nor good fellowship in thee. Nor camest thou not of the blood royal, if thou darest not stand for ten shillings. Well, once in my days, I'll be a mad cat. Why, that's well said. Well, come on, Will, I'll tarry at home. By the Lord, I'll be a traitor when thou art king. I care not. Sir John. <coughs> Privy, leave the prince and me alone a while. I'll lay him down such reasons for this adventure that uh, he shall go. God give thee spirit of good persuasion that the true prince may, for recreation's sake, prove a false thief. Farewell. 
shall find me in East Cheap. <laughs> Farewell, thou latter spring. Farewell, all hallowed summer. Now, my good sweet honey lord, right with us tomorrow. Oh, oh for I have a jest to execute that I cannot manage alone. Falkstar, Bardolf, Pedo, and Gads Hill shall rob these men that you have already waylaid. Myself and I shall not be there. Then, when they have the booty, if you and I do not rob them, cut this head from my shoulder. How shall we part with them and send him forth? Appoint them a place of meeting wherein it is our pleasure to fail. <laughs> then will they adventure upon the exploit themselves, which they shall no sooner have achieved, but you and I will set upon them. Yea, but I doubt they'll know us by our horses, and I have us in every other appointment to be ourselves. Our horses they shall not see, I'll tie them in the wood. Huh. Our visors will change after we leave them, and so that. I have suits of buckram for the nuns. Two in mask are noted familiar garments. Yeah, but it's like they'll be too hard for us. <laughs> yeah, well, for two of them, I know them to be as true bred cowards as ever turned back. <laughs> and for the third, well, if he fights longer than he sees reason, I'll persuade on. The virtue of the jest will be the incomprehensible lies that this same fat rogue will tell us when we meet him at supper. <laughs> How thirty at least he fought with. What uh, wars, what blows, what extremities he endured. And in the reproof of this, therein lives the jest. Well, I will go with thee. Provide us with all things necessary and meet me tomorrow night in East Chief. There are some. Farewell. Farewell, my lord. I know you all, and will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Yet herein will I imitate the sun, who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world. When he please again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists of vapors that seem to strangle him. If all the year were playing holidays to sport, would be as tedious as to work. But when they seldom come, they wish for come. And nothing pleaseth but rare accidents. So, when this loose behavior I throw off, and pay the debt I never promised, by how much better than my word I am, by so much will I falsify men's hopes. And like bright metal on a sullen ground, my reformation glittering or my fault shall show more goodly and attract more eyes than that which hath no foil to set it off. I also offend to make offense a skill. Redeeming time when men least think I will. My blood hath been too cold and tempered. And up to stir these indignities. And you have found me. For accordingly you tread upon my patience. But be sure, I will from henceforth rather be myself. Mighty and to be feared than my condition, which has been as smooth as oil, soft, and as young down, and therefore lost that title of respect which the proud soul ne'er pays but to the proud. Our house, my sovereign liege, little deserves the scourge of greatness to be used on it, and that same greatness, too, which our own hands have helped to make so portly. My lord... Worcester, get thee gone, for I will see danger and disobedience in thine eye. Oh, sir... Your presence is too bold and peremptory. And majesty might never yet endure the moody frontier of a servant brow. You have good leave to leave us. When we need your use and counsel, we will send for you. You were about to speak. Yea, my good lord. Those prisoners in your highness's name demanded 
which Harry Percy here at Holden took, were, as he says, not with such strength denied as is delivered to your majesty. Either envy, therefore, or misprision is guilty of this fault, and not my son. Our liege, I did deny no prisoners. For I remember when the fight was done, when I was dry with rage and extreme toil, breathless and faint, leaning upon me sword, came there a certain lord, neat and trimly dressed, fresh as a bridegroom, and his chin new reap showed like a stubble and at harvest home. He was perfumed like a milliner, and twixt his finger and his thumb he held a punsy box, which ever and anon he gave his nose and took it away again. And still he smiled and talked, and as the soldiers bore dead bodies by, he called them untoward knaves unmannerly to bring a slovenly unhandsome course betwixt the wind and his nobility. With many holiday and lady terms he questioned me, amongst the rest demanded my prisoners in your majesty's behalf. I then all smartened with my wounds being called to be so pestered with a popping out of my grief and my impatience answering neglectedly, I know not what he should or he should not, for he made me mad <laughs> to see him shine so brisk and smell so sweet and talk so like a weeding gentlewoman of guns and drums and wounds, God save them up, and telling me the sovereignest thing on earth was parmacetti for an inward bruise, and that it was great pity, so it was, this villainous saltpeter should be digged out of the bowels of the harmless earth, which many a good tall fellow had destroyed so cowardly, and but for these vile goons, he would himself have been a soldier. This bald, unjointed chatter is, my lord, I answered, Indirectly, as I said, and I beseech you, let not his report come current for an accusation betwixt my love and your high majesty. The circumstance considered, good my lord, whatever Lord Harry Percy then had said to such a person and in such a place may reasonably die and never rise to do him wrong or any way impeach what then he said, so he unsaid now. Why yet he doth deny his prisoners. But on for the visor and exception that we, at our own charge, shall ransom straight his brother-in-law, the foolish Mortimer, who on my soul hath willfully betrayed the lives of those whom he did lead to fight against that great magician, damned Lendauer, whose daughter, as we hear, Mortimer hath lately married. Shall our coffers then be emptied to redeem a traitor home? No. On the barren mountain, let him starve. But I shall never call that man my friend, whose tongue shall ask me for one penny cost to ransom home revolted Mortimer. Revolted Mortimer? He never did fall off, my sovereign liege, but by the chance of war. To prove that true needs no more but one tongue for all those wounds. Those mouthed wounds which valiantly he took when on the gentle seven sedgy bank, in single opposition, hand to hand, he did confound the best part of an hour in changing hardiment with great Glendower. Never did bare and rotten policy colour her work and with such deadly wounds. Then let not him be slandered with revolt. Thou dost belie him, Percy. Thou dost belie him. He never did encounter with Glendower. I tell thee he durst as well have met the devil alone as Owen Glendower for an enemy. Art thou not ashamed? But henceforth, sirrah, let me not hear you speak of Mortimer. Send us your prisoners with your speediest means, or you will hear from me in such a kind as will displease you. My Lord Northumberland, we license your departure with your son. Send us your prisoners. 
or you will hear of it. Come and roar for him, I will not send him. I'll have to straighten and tell him so, for I'll ease my heart, or be a mega hazard in my head. And what? So we call us here. Here comes your uncle. Speak! Good morning, man! Soon, sir, speak of him. And let my soul want mercy if I do not join with him. Yea, on his part, I'll empty all these veins and shed my dear blood drop by drop in the dust. But I'll lift the downtrodden Mortimer as high in the air as this unthankful king, as this ingrate and cankered Ballinbrook! Brother, the king hath made your nephew mad. Who struck this heat up after I was gone? He will pursue them all my prisoners. And when he hears the ransom once again of my wife's brother, then his cheek looked pale, and on my face he turned an eye of death. Trembling even at the name of Mortimer. I cannot blame him. Was not he proclaimed by Richard that dead is the next of blood? He was. I heard the proclamation. And then it was when the unhappy king, whose wrongs in us God pardon, did set forth upon his Irish expedition from whence he intercepted, did return to be deposed and shortly murdered. And for whose death we, in the world's wide mouth, live scandalized and foully spoken of. But so. I pray you, did King Richard then proclaim my brother, Edmund Mortimer, heir to the crown? He did. Myself did hear it. <laughs> Nay, nee, then I cannot blame his cousin king that wished him on the barren mountain staff. But shall it be that you that set the crown up on the head of this forgetful man, and for his sake, where the detested blot of murderous subination, shall it be the men of your nobility and power to engage them both in an unjust behalf, as both of you, God pardon it, have done, to put down Richard that sweet, lovely rose and plant this thorn, this canker, Bolingbroke, and shall I in more shame be further spoken, be you fool, discarded and shook off, by him for all these shames you underwent. No, yet time serves wherein you may redeem your banished honours and restore yourselves into the good thoughts of the world again. Revenge the cheer in this day contempt of this proud king. Therefore I say... Peace, cousin. Speak no more. Those same noble Scots that are your prisoners... I'll keep them all. By God, he shall not have a scar of them. No, if a Scot would save his soul, he shall not. I'll keep them by this hand. You start away and lend no ear on my purposes. Those prisoners you shall keep. Nay, I will. <laughs> That's flat. He said he would not ransom Mortimer. For bad my tongue to speak of Mortimer. But I'll find him when he lies asleep. And in his ear I'll holler, Mortimer! Nay, I'll have a style and she'll be taught to speak nothing but my man. And give it him to keep his anger still in motion. Here, you cousin, a word. All studies here I solemnly defy. Save out of goal and pinch this. Ballenbrock and that same sword and buckler, Prince of Wales. But I think his father loves him not and will be glad he met with some mischance and have him poisoned with a pot of ale. Farewell, kinsman. I'll talk to you when you are better tempered to attend. Oh, why would a wash down a patient fool like thou to break into this woman's room? Tying my ear to no tongue but I know. Why, look you! I'm whipped and scourged with rods, nettled and stung with piss my ass. When I hear of this vile politician. Bolingbroke. Go on, Uncle, tell your tale. I've done. <laughs> Nay, if you have not to it again, we'll stay your leisure. I'm done, he faith. Then once more to your Scottish prisoners. 
deliver them up without their ransom straight and make the Douglas son your only mean for powers in Scotland. You, my lord, shall secretly into the bosom creep of that same noble prelate well-beloved, the Archbishop. Of York, is he not? True, who bears hard his brother's execution, the Lord Scroop. I speak not this in estimation as what I think might be, but what I know is ruminated, plotted, and set down, and only stays but to behold the face of that occasion that shall bring it on. Ah, oh, smell it. Upon my life, it'll do well. Oh, the game is afoot. I still let slip. Why? It cannot choose but be a noble plot. And then, the power of Scotland and New York to join with Mortimer, huh? And so they shall. In faith, it's exceedingly well aimed. And tis no little reason bids us speed to save our heads by raising of a head. For bear ourselves as even as we can, the king will always think him in our debt and think we think ourselves unsatisfied till he hath found a time to pay us home. And see already how he doth begin to make us strangers to his looks of love. He does. He does. We'll be revenged on him. Cousin, farewell. No further go in this than I by letters shall direct our course. When time is ripe, which shall be suddenly, I'll steal the Glendower and Lord Mortimer, where you and Douglas and our powers at once, as I will fashion it, shall happily meet, to bear our fortune in our own strong arms. Farewell, good brother. We shall thrive, I trust. Uncle! Adio! Oh, let the hours be short! Till fields and blows and groans applaud our sport! I'll remove both glasses, but he's fresh like a gambler. Handcuffs! Points! Points are behind points! What a brawling does thou keep? Where's points? I walk up the top of the hill, I'll go seek him. I am accursed to rob in that thief's company. The rascal hath removed my horse and tied him I know not where. If I travel four foot by the square further afoot, I shall break my wind. <laughs> well, and I do not hope but to die a fair death for all this. If I should escape hanging for killing the rogue, I have forsworn his company hourly any time this two and twenty years. And yet I am bewitched by the rogue's company. And he hath not given me medicines to make me love him, I'll be hanged. It cannot be else. I have drunk medicines. Points! Help! A plague upon you both! Baro! Peter! I'll starve ere I rub a foot further. Eight yards of an even ground is three score and ten miles a foot with me. And the stony-hearted villains know it well enough. A plague upon it when thieves cannot be true one to another. <whistles> a plague upon you both! Give me my horse, you rogues! Give me my horse and be hanged! Lie down, lay thine ear to the ground, and list if thou canst hear the tread of travellers. Have any levers to lift me up again, being down? I pray thee, good Prince Hal, help me to my horse, good King son. Out, you rogue, shall I be your ostler? Hang thyself in thine own ear, apparent garters. And I have not ballads made of you all and sung to filthy tunes. May I come and sack me my poison? Stay! So I do, against my will. Right off, what news? Casey, Casey, put on your visards. There's money from the king's coming down the hill that's going to the king's exchequer. Well, my road is going to the king's tavern. There's enough to make us all to be hanged, sirs. You four shall front them in the narrow lane. Net points and I will walk lower. Then if they escape your encounter, they light upon us. How many be there of them? Some eight or ten. Jones! Will they not rob us? What? A coward, Sir John Paunch. Indeed, I am not John of Gaunt, your grandfather, and yet no coward out. Well, we'll leave that to the proof. Sir sure, Jack, thy horse stands behind the hedge. When thou needst him, there thou will find him. The farewell, and stand fast. Oh, cannot I strike him when I should be hanged? Now, my masters, happy man be his doe, say I. Well, neighbor. The boy will lead our horses down the hill. Every man to his business. He'll walk for a while. He's our men.
are not two arrant cowards. There's no equity stirring. There is no more valour in that poins than in a wild duck. Your money! to the love I bear your host. It could be contented. Why is he not then? In respect to the love he bears your host. He shows him this. He loves his own bar. but he loves our host. Let me see some more. The purpose you undertake is dangerous. Well, that's it. It's dangerous to take a cold, to sleep, to drink, but I tell you, oh my lord, fool, out of this nettle danger, we pluck this flower. Safety! The purpose you undertake is dangerous. The friends you have named uncertain, the time itself unsorted, and your whole plot too light for the counterpoise of so great an opposition. Say you so. Say you so. I say unto you again that you're a shallow, cowardly hind and you lie! What a left brain is this! By the Lord! Our plot is a good plot as ever was laid. Our friends true and constant. It's a good plot. Good friends and full of expectation. It's an excellent plot. Very good friends. What a pagan rascal is this. Why? My lord of York commends the plot. And the general course of the action zooms around. Now by this rascal. I could brain him with his lady's fan. Is there not my father? My uncle? And myself, my lord of Nordima, and Owen Glendower, is there not besides the Douglas? Have I not all their letters to meet me in arms by the ninth of the next month? And are they not some of them set forward already? What a pagan rascal is this, an infidel! <laughs> yeah. You shall see now in very sincerity of fear and cool heart. Willie to the king and lay open all our proceedings. Oh, I could divide myself and good of buffets for moving such a dish of skimmed milk with so honourable an action. Let him tell the king. We are prepared. I'll set forward tonight. Now, now, kid. I must leave you within these two hours. Oh, my good lord, why are you thus alone? For what offence have I this fortnight 
been a banished woman from my Harry's bed. Tell me, sweet lord, what is it that takes from thee thy stomach, pleasure, and thy golden sleep? Why dost thou bend thine eyes upon the earth, and start so often when thou sit'st alone? Why hast thou lost the fresh blood in thy cheeks, and given my treasures and my rights of thee to thick-eyed musing and cursed melancholy? In thy faint slumbers I by thee have watched, and heard thee murmur tales of iron wars, cry courage to the field. And thou hast talked of sallies and retires, of trenches, tents, of prisoners' ransom, and of soldiers slain, and all the currents of a heady fight. Thy spirit within thee hath been so at war, and thus hath so bestirred thee in thy sleep, that beads of sweat have stood upon thy brow like bubbles in a late disturbed stream, and in thy face strange motions have appeared, such as we see when men restrain their breath on some great sudden hest. Oh, what portents are these? Some heavy business hath my lord in hand, and I must know it, else he loves me not. What out! It's Williams from the packet dog. He is, my lord, an hour ago. A butler brought those horses from the sheriff. One horse, my lord, he brought even now. What horse? A roan, a crop ear, is it not? It is, my lord. That roan shall be my throne. Well, I'll back him straight. Oh, Esperance. But hear you, my lord. What seest thou, my lady? What is it carries you away? Why, my horse, my lord, my horse. <laughs> Oh, you mad, heavy day! A weasel hath not such a deed of spleen, and you are tossed with. It's great. I know your business, Harry. That I will. I fear my brother Mortimer to stir about his title, and has sent for you to line his enterprise. But if you go, so far afoot, I shall be weary, Lord. Come, you parakeeto! Answer me directly unto this question that I ask. I'll break thy little finger, Harry. And if thou wilt not tell me all this oh. truth... Away! <laughs> Away, you trifler! Love! I love thee not. I care not for thee, kid. This is no work to play with mammoths and to tilt with lips. We must have bloody noses and crack crowns and pass some current down. Oh. God's pray. My horse! What seest thou, kid? What wouldst thou have with me? Do you not love me? Do you not indeed? Well, do not, then. But since you love me not, I will not love myself. <laughs> do you not love me? Oh. Mm. Nay, tell me if you speak in jest or no! Oh. Come! <laughs> will thou see me ride? I'm willing my horse back. I'll swear, I love thee infinitely. <laughs> but hark you, kid. I must not have you henceforth question me whither I go, no reason where about, whither I must, I must. And to conclude, this evening must I leave you. Gentle, kid. I know you're wise. But yet no farther wise than Harry Percy's wife. Constant ya, but yet a woman, and for secrecy no lady closer. For I will believe thou wilt not utter what thou dost not know. And so far will I trust thee. Gentle kid. How? So far? And not an inch further. Where are you, kid? Whither I go, thither shall you go too. <laughs> Today will I set forth. Tomorrow you will discontent you, kid. It must of force. <laughs>
Sinner, I have sounded the very base string of humility. I am sworn brother to a leash of drawers. I can call them all by their Christian names, as uh, Tom, Dick, and Francis. <laughs> yeah, they take it already upon their salvation. So though I be but Prince of Wales, yet I am the King of Courtesy. And tell me flatly that when I am King of England, I shall command all the good lads to be sheep. To conclude, I am so good a proficient in one quarter of an hour that I can drink with any tinker in his own language during my life. But sweet Ned, to sweeten which name of Ned, I give thee this pennyworth of sugar, clapped into my hands even now by an underskinker, one that never spake more English in his life than eight shillings and sixpence. Score a pint of bastard in the half moon or so, a sweet Ned. Yes. To drive away the time till Falstaff come, do thou stand in some by room while I question my puny drawer to what end he gave me the sugar. And do thou never leave calling Francis that his tale to me may be nothing but well, anon, anon, sir. Now step aside, I'll show thee a precedence. Hey, oh, fr Francis. 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 Come on. Francis. 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 Come hither, Francis. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. Hey, my lord. How long hast thou to serve, Francis? I've pursued him five years. And as much as and none and none, sir. Five years by a lady, a long lease for the clinking of future, but Francis. Dare us thou be so valiant as to play the coward with thy indenture and show it a fair pair of heels and run from it. Oh, Lord, sir, I'd be sworn upon all the books in England. I could find it in me heart. Francis! And none and none, sir. Now, how old art thou, Francis? Oh, um. Let me see. Uh, well, I'll make us next. I'll be. Uh, Francis! Uh, and none, sir, a priest, sir, stay there. Lily, 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 but say, hark you, Francis, now, for the uh, sugar thou gavest me, twas a pennyworth, was it not? Oh, Lord, sir, I would it had been two. I will give thee for it a thousand pound. Ask me when thou wilt, and thou shalt have it. Francis! A nun, a nun, Francis, no, Francis, but tomorrow, Francis, or oh, Francis, a Thursday, or oh, Francis, when thou wilt, but Francis, <laughs> my lord, wilt thou rob this leather jerkin, puke stocking, caddis scott, a smooth tongue, Spanish pouch? What, sir? Why, then, your brown bastard is your only drink, for look you, Francis, your white canvas doublet will sully. In Barbary, sir, it cannot come so much. Uh, Francis! Away, you rogue, does not hear them call. Francis! Francis! What? Standest thou still, and here is such a calling? Look to the guest within! My lord, out Sir John and half a dozen more at the door. Shall I let them in? No, let them alone a while, then open the door. Pines! Ah, no, 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 sir! Falstaff and the rest of the thieves are at the door. Shall we be merry? Oh, it's merry as cricket sled. Um, Marky. What cunning kind of match have you made with this jest of the draw? What's the issue? Ah, I am now of all humours that have called themselves humours since the old days of Goodman Adam. Oh, what's a clock, Francis? Uh, uh, none, none, sir. <laughs> there, this fellow should have fewer words than a parrot, and yet the son of a woman. I'm not yet of Percy's mind. The hot spur of the north. He that kills me some six or seven dozen Scots at a breakfast. Washes his hands and says to his wife, Fay upon this quiet wife. I want work. Oh, my sweet Harry, says she. How many hast thou killed today? <laughs> Give him a roan horse a drink, says he. And then answers, some fourteen an hour after. A trifle. A trifle. I pretty call him four stop. I'll play Percy. And that damn brawl shall play Dame Mortimer, his wife. Oh, huh? oh, oh, cries the drunkard. Call in ribs. Call in tallow. A plague 
of all cowards, I say, and of vengeance too. Marry an armed men. Give me a cup of sack, boy. A plague of all cowards, I say. Give me a cup of sack, rogue. Is there no virtue expanded? Just so I never see Titan kiss a dish of butter. <laughs> you rogue, there's lime in this sack too. There is nothing but roguery to be found in villainous man. Yet a coward is worse than a cup of sack with lime in it. A villainous coward. Go thy ways, old Jack. <laughs> Die when thou wilt. If manhood, good manhood, be not forgotten on the face of the earth, I am a shotten herring. There lives not three good men unhanged in all England, and one of them is fat and grows old. How now? Bull sack. What matter you? A king's son. If I do not beat thee out of thy kingdom with a dagger of lath and drive all thy subjects before thee like a flock of wild geese, I'll ne'er wear hair on my face more. You, prince of Wales. Why, you horse and round man, what's the matter? Are you not a coward? Answer me to that. Hand the points there. Zooms, you fat punch. You call me a coward, and by the Lord, I'll stab thee. I call thee a coward. Now, I see thee damn near, I call thee a coward. But I would give a thousand pounds I could run as fast as thou canst. You straight it up across the shoulders. You care not who sees your back. <laughs> give me a cup of sack. I am a rogue if I drunk today. <laughs> oh, villain, thy lips are scarce white since thou drunk's last. All's one for that, a plague of all... Coward still, I say. What's the matter? What's the matter? There are four of us here have taken a thousand pounds this day morning. Yeah. Where is it, Jack? Where is it? Taken from us oh. it is. A hundred upon the poor four of us. Yeah. What a hundred, man. I escaped by miracle. I am eight times thrust through doublet, four through the hose, my buckler cut through and through, my sword hacked like a handsaw. Etchy <laughs> signum! I never dealt better since I was a man. All would not do, let them speak. If they speak more or less than the truth, they are villains and the sons of darkness. Speak, sirs. How was it? We four set upon some dozen. Sixteen at least, my lord. And bound them. No, no, they were not bound. They were bound. Every man of them. Or I am a Jew else, eh? An Eve rude Jew. As we were sharing, some six or seven fresh men set upon us. And unbound the others. And then come in the rest. What? Fought you with them all. All? I know not what you call all. But if I did not fight with fifty of them, I'm a bunch of radish. <laughs> Pray God you have not murdered some of them. Nay, that's past praying for. Two I have peppered. Two I know I have paid. Two rogues in buckram suits. Yeah. I tell thee what, Hal, if I tell thee a lie, spit in my face. Call me horse. <laughs> Thou knowest my old ward. Here I lay. <laughs> and thus I bore my <laughs> point. <laughs> Four rogues in Buckram neck drive at me. Four? No such, but two even now. Oh, no, four, Hal, I told thee four. Aye, aye, he said four. four. And these four in Buckram came many a front and thrust at me. With no more to do, I took all their seven points and my target <laughs> thrust. Seven? <laughs> Why, there were four even now. In Buckram? Aye, four in Buckram suits. Seven by these hilts, or I am a villain else. Say they let him alone, we shall have more anon. <laughs> Dost thou hear, Hal? I, I and, um... Mark thee too, Jack. Do so, for it is worth the listening. These nine in Buckland ah, that I told you of. So, two more or any. Their points been broken. Down fell their hand. Ah, ah, down to the ground. I came in close. Foot and hand. Foot and hand. And with a thought, seven of the eleven I paid. Yeah. <laughs> Eleven buckram men grown out of two. <laughs> but as the devil would have it, three misbegotten knaves in Kendal Green kept at my back and they drive at me for hell. It was so dark thou couldst not see thy own hand. These lies are like their father that begets them. 
gross as a mountain. <laughs> Open, palpable, why thou clay-brained gut, <laughs> thou naughty-pated fool, <laughs> thou horse and greasy, obscene tallow cat. <laughs> what art thou mad? Art thou mad? <laughs> Is not the truth the truth? How couldst thou know these men in Kendall Green when it was so dark thou couldst not see thine own hand? Tell us your reason. What sayest thou to this? Your reason, Jack. Your reason. Give you a reason on compulsion? <laughs> Zooms were I at the strapado. Or in all the racks of the world I would not tell upon compulsion. Give you a reason on compulsion? If reasons were as plentiful as blackberries, I would give no man a reason on compulsion. I will be no longer guilty of this sin. This sanguine coward. Yeah. <laughs> this bed presser. Yeah. <laughs> this horseback breaker. Yeah. <laughs> this huge hill of flesh yes. yes. bloody you stop yes. you eel skin yes. you dry neat tongue yes. you fool's pizzle yes. you spotfish all that I have bred to other what thou art like you tailor's yard you sheep you bowcase you vile standing tuck <laughs> well breathe a while and then chew it again <laughs> And when I was tired by sir, with base comparisons, hear me speak the this. We two saw you four set on for and were masters of their wealth. Mark now how a plain tale shall put you down. Then did we two set on you four and with a word outfaced you from your prize and have it and can show it to you here in the house. Full stop. You carried your guts away as nimbly, with as quick dexterity, and roared for mercy, and still ran and roared, as ever I heard Bullcalf. <laughs> <laughs> what device didst thou now find out to hide thee from this open and apparent shame? Come, Jack. What trick hast thou now, eh? By the Lord, lad, I knew ye as well as he that made ye. What? <laughs> Why, hear ye, my masters, was it for me to kill the heir apparent? Oh. <laughs> Thou knowest I am as valiant as Hercules, but beware instinct. The lion will not touch the true prince. <laughs> instinct is a great matter. I was now a coward on instinct. And I shall think the better of myself and thee during my life. I for a valiant lion, yeah. <laughs> and thou for a true prince. But by the Lord, lads, oh, I'm glad you have the money. <laughs> Hostess, yeah. clap to the doors. Watch tonight, pray tomorrow. Gallants, lads, boys, hearts of gold. All titles of good fellowship come to you. What shall we be merry? Yes! Shall we have a play extempore? Yes! Content! Yes. And the argument shall be thy running away. Oh, no more of that, lad, if thou lovest me. <laughs> Tis you, my lord, the prince. Oh, no, my lady, the hostess, what sayest thou to me? Mary, my lord. There is a nobleman of the court at door would speak with you. He says he comes from your father. I'll give him as much as will make him a royal man and send him back again to my mother. <laughs> what manner of man is he? An old man. What doth gravity out of his bed at midnight? Shall I give him answer? Aye, aye, aye. Pretty do, Jack. I'll send him packing. <laughs> oh, You fought well, so did you, Peter, and you, Bardolph. Your lions, too, you ran away upon instinct. You will not touch the true prince, no. I, Faith, I, I ran when I saw others run. Think <laughs> out, you're telling me in good earnest. How came Falstaff's sword so hacked? Why, well, he hacked it with his dagger. Said he would swear truth out of England, but he'd make you believe he'd done it in fight. <laughs> And he persuaded us to do the like. And to trickle our noses with spear grass and make them bleed and 
be slabber our garments with it and swear it was the blood of true men. <laughs> I did that I did not this seven year before. I blushed <laughs> to hear his monstrous device. Oh, villain, thou stolest a cup of sack 18 years ago, and ever since thou hast blushed extempore. <laughs> <laughs> thou hast fire and sword by thy side, yet thou ranst away. What instinct hast thou for? My lord, you see these meteors. Do you behold these exhalations? I do. What think you they portend? Hot livers and cold person. <laughs> Collar, my lord, if rightly taken. No, if rightly taken. <laughs> Halter. Yeah. Ah, here comes bare bone. Here comes lean Jack. Oh, no, my sweet creature of bombast. How long ago is it, Jack, since thou sawest thine own knee? Mine own knee? Uh, when I was about thy years, Hal, I was not an eagle's talon in the waist, a plague upon <laughs> sighing and grief. It blows them up like a bladder. Yeah. There's villainous news abroad. Here was Sir John Bracy from your father. You must have caught in the morning. That same mad fellow of the North, Percy. And he of Wales, what, what, what a plague are calling. Oh, Glendower. Oh, in, oh, in the same, oh. and his son-in-law Mortimer, and old Northumberland, and that sprightly Scot of Scots Douglas. He that rides a horseback of a hill perpendicular. <laughs> and one more day, and a thousand blue caps more, all risen in rebellion. Worcester is stolen away tonight. Thy father's beard is turned white with the news. Oh. You can buy land now, that is cheap as stinking mac. <laughs> It's like then. If there come a hot June, at this civil buffeting hole, we shall buy maiden hands as they buy hobnails. By the hundreds. By the Lord, lad, thou sayest true there. Who tis like we shall have good trading that way. But art thou not horribly afeard, thou being heir apparent, could the world prick thee out three such enemies again? As that fiend Douglas, that spirit Percy, and that devil Glendower? Art thou not afraid? Doth thy blood not thrill at it? Not a wet of faith. <laughs> I lack some of thy instinct. <laughs> well, you'll be horribly chid tomorrow when you come to see your father. If thou lovest me, <gasps> practice an answer. Do thou stand for my father and examine me on the particulars of my life? Shall I? Yes! yes! Content! This chair shall be my speech. Ah, this dagger shall be my scepter. And this cushion my crown. <laughs> And my precious rich crown for a pitiful bald crown. And the fire of grace be not quite out of thee now, should thou be moved. Give me a cup of sack uh, to make my eyes look red. For it must be thought that I have wept, for I must speak with passion. And I will do it in King Cambyses' vein. Oh, yeah. well, here is my leg. And here's my speech. Stand as Stand 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 aside, no ability. Oh, Jesu, this is excellent sportify. Weep not, sweet queen, but trickling tears are vain. Oh, the father, see how he holds his countenance. For God's sake, lords, convey my tristful queen. What tears do stop the floodgates of her eyes? He does it like any harlot replier as ever I did see. Peace, good pipe. Peace, good tickle brain. Harry. <laughs> Harry, I do not only marvel how thou spendst thy time, but also how thou art accompanied. 
And thou art my son of partly a mother's word, <laughs> partly mine own opinion, but chiefly a villainous trick of thine eye and a foolish hanging of thy nether lip that warrant me. If then thou art my son, here lies the point. Why, being son to me, art thou so pointed at? <laughs> Shall the son of England prove a thief and take purses? Yes! <laughs> question to be asked. <laughs> there is a thing, Harry, that is known to thee, and known to many throughout the land by the name of Pitch. And this Pitch, as ancient writers do report, doth defile. So doth the company thou keepst, Harry, for now I speak to thee, not in drink, but in tears. Not in pleasure, but in passion. <laughs> Not in words only, but in woes. <laughs> and yet, Harry, there is a virtuous man that I have often noted in thy company, and yet I know not his name. <laughs> Um, what manner of man is like your majesty? Oh, a goodly, portly man, he says. <laughs> and a corpulent, with a pleasing eye, a cheerful look, and a most noble carriage. And as I think his age, some fifty years. Fifty? <laughs> By our lady inclining to three score. <laughs> and now I remember me. His name is Fausto! If that man should be lewdly given, he deceiveth me. For, Harry, I see virtue in his looks. <laughs> there is virtue in that Fausto! Him keep with the rest, banish. And tell me now, thou naughty varlet, <laughs> where thou hast been this last month, thou speak like a king. Do thou stand for me, I'll play my father. Depose me! <laughs> if thou dost it half so bravely, half so majestically, both in word and matter, hang me up by the heels for a rabbit sucker or a poulterer's head. <laughs> There is a devil haunts thee in the likeness of an old fat man. <laughs> a ton of man is thy companion. Why dost thou converse with that trunk of humours, that boating hutch of beastliness, <laughs> that swollen parcel of dropsy, yes. that huge bombard of sack, yes. that stuffed cloak bag of guts yes. and roasted manning tree ox with a pudding in his belly. Yes. A reverend ice, yes. a great iniquity, yes. father ruffian, yes. and is he in you? Yes. Oh, wherein is he gone? <laughs> but to taste sack and to drink it, yes. wherein neat and cleanly, but to carve a capon and eat it, yes. wherein cunning but in craft, yes. wherein Laughter in villainy, yeah. and in villainous, but in all things, yeah. well in worthy, but in no I would your grace would take me with you. Who means your grace? Why, <laughs> <laughs> that villainous, abominable misleader of youth. Oh! 
to say more than I know. <laughs> that he is old, no more the pity. His white hairs do witness it. But that he is, saving your reverence, a whore master, that I utterly deny. <laughs> if sack and sugar be a fault, then God help the wicked. If to be old and merry were a sin, and there's many an old host that I know is damned. If to be fat, be hated, then Pharaoh's lean kind are to be loved. No, my good Lord, banish Peter. Yes! Banish Bardolph. Yes! yes. Banish Point. Yes! yes. <laughs> but the sweet Jack Falstaff Kind Jack Falstaff, true Jack Falstaff, valiant Jack Falstaff, and being more valiant as he is, old Jack Falstaff. Banish not him, thy Harry's company. Banish not him, thy Harry's company. Banish plump Jack, and you banish all the world. I do. I will. Shit! Shit down! I know! I know! An old chief justice and a monstrous watcher at the door. Out your road, play out the play. I have much to say on behalf of this Jack Fullstop. Jeez, you. My lord, my lord, the Lord Chief Justice and all the watcher at the door that come to search the house. Shall hear? I let them in? Dost thou hear how never call a true piece of gold a counterfeit? Thou art essentially made without seeming so. And thou a natural coward without instinct. I deny your major. If ye will deny the sheriff so, if not regimenter. Don't hide thee behind the arrow. Set the rest, walk over one. Now, my masters, for a good pace and a true conscience. Both which I have, but their date is out, therefore I'll hide me. Yeah. your will with me. First, pardon me, my lord. Mm. A hue and cry hath followed certain men unto this house. What men? One of them is well known, my gracious lord. A gross fat man. As fat as butter. <laughs> <laughs> the man Sure, you is not here, for I myself at this time have employed him. And justice, I will engage my word to thee that I will by tomorrow dinner time send him to answer thee or any man for anything he shall be charged with all. And so let me entreat you leave the house. I will, my lord. <laughs> There are two gentlemen who have in this robbery lost 300 marks. Maybe so, if you have robbed these men, he shall be answerable, and so farewell! Good night, my noble lord. I think it is good morrow, is it not? <laughs> Indeed, my lord, I think it be three o'clock. Rascal is known as well as Paul's. 
Go, call him forth. Foster! 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 Foster's asleep behind the arras and snoring like a horse. Ah, <laughs> oh, can't hardly fetch his breath. <laughs> Search his pockets. No. Stop it, Stop it. What's that bad? Uh, nothing but papers, my lord. Let's see what they'd be. Read them. Um, read them. Um. Item a capon. Two and two. Item sauce. Fourpence. Item sack. Two gallons. Five and eight. Item anchovies and sack after supper, half a crown. Item bread, halfpenny. <laughs> oh, monstrous. Well, I'm halfpenny worth of bread to this intolerable deal of sack. <laughs> there, let him sleep till day. Out of the court in the morning. We must all to the wars. Thy place shall be honourable. I procure this fat rogue a charge of foot, but I know his death will be a march of twelve score. <laughs> <laughs> the money shall be paid back again with advantage. He will be betimes in the morning. So good morrow, Peter. Good morrow, good my lord. These promises are fair, the party's sure, and our inductions full of prosperous hope. Lord Mortimer, and Cousin Glengarry, will you sit down? And Uncle Worcester. Plague upon it, I forgot the map. Oh, no. <laughs> Here it is. Say it, Cousin Percy. Say it, good Cousin Hotspur. Oh, by that name. As oft as Lancaster does speak of you, his cheek looks pale, and with a rising sigh, he wishes you in heaven. And you in hell, as oft as he is, O England, I was spoke of. I cannot blame him. At my nativity, the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes and burning cressets. And at my birth, the frame and huge foundation of the earth Shaked like a coward. Why, so it would have done at the same season if your mother's cat had but kitten. <laughs> oh, yourself had never been born. I say the earth did shake when I was born. And I say the earth was not of my mind if you suppose it's fair in you. It shook. The heavens were all on fire. The earth did tremble. Oh, then the earth shook to see the heavens on fire and not in fear of your nativity. For then... Of many men I do not bear these crossings. Pray, give me leave to tell you once again that at my birth the front of heaven was full of fiery shapes and burning cressets. The goats ran from the mountains and the herds were strangely peaceful to those quieted fields. These signs have marked me extraordinary 
and all the courses of my life to show. I am not in the role of common man. Where is he living that is but woman's son? Can trace me in the tedious ways of art. Or hold me pace in deep experiments. I think there's no man speaks better Welsh out of dinner. Please, Cousin Percy. You will make him mad. I can call spirits from the vasty deep. Why, so can I, and so can any man. But will they come when you do call for them? <laughs> Why, I can teach you, cousin, to command the devil. And I can teach thee, cause to shame the devil by telling truth. Tell truth and shame the devil. If thou art far to raise him, bring him hither, and I'll be sworn. I have power to shame him and... Come, come. No more of this unprofitable chat. Three times hath Henry Bolingbroke made head against my power. Thrice from the ranks of Wye and Sunday Bottom Severn have I sent him bootless home and weather-beaten back. Home without boots and in foul weather too. How scapes the egos in the devil's name? Come! Here is the map. Shall we divide our right according to our threefold order taken? The archdeacon hath divided it into three limits very equally. England, from Trent to Severn, hitherto by south and east, is to my part assigned. All westward, Wales, beyond the Severn shore, and all fertile land within that bound to Owen Glendower. Aye. Right. And dear cards to you, the remnant northward lying off from Trent. Tomorrow, cousin Percy, you and I, and my good lord of Worcester, will set forth to meet your father and the Scottish power as is appointed us yeah, yeah. at Shrewsbury. The father Glendower is not ready yet, nor shall we need his help these 14 days. And within that space, you may have drawn together your tenants, friends, and neighboring gentlemen. A shorter time shall send me to you, lords. And in my conduct shall your ladies come, from whom you now must steal and take no leave, for there will be a world of water shed upon the parting of your wives and you. Methinks my moiety north from Burton here in quantity equals not one of yours. See. How this river comes me cranking in and cuts me from the best of all my land. A huge half moon, a monstrous cantle out. I'll have the current in this place dammed up. And here, the smug and silver trench shall run in a new channel, fair and evenly. Shall not wind with such a deep indent to rob me of so rich a bottom here. Not wind? It shall, it must, when you see it done. Yea, but mark how he bears his course. And runs me up with like advantage on the other side. Gelding the opposed continent as much as on the other side it takes from you. Right, yea, but a little charge will trench him here. And on this north side win this cape of land. And then he runs straight and even. I'll have it so. A little charge will do it. I'll not have it altered. Will not you? No. Nor you shall not. And who shall say me nay? Why? That... Will I? Let me not understand you then. Speak it in Welsh. I can speak English, cuz, as well as you. For I was trained up in the English court. Where being but young, I framed to the harp many an English ditty lovely well, and gave the tongue a helpful ornament, a virtue that was never seen in you. <laughs> Marion, I'm glad of it with all my heart. I'd rather hear a brazen canstick turn or a dry wheel grate on the axle tree. And that would set my teeth nothing on edge, nothing so much as mincing poetry. It's like the false gate of a shuffling nag. Come! You shall have Trent turn. I do not care. <laughs> I'll give thrice so much land to any well-deserving friend, but in the way of bargain, mark ye me. 
I'll cavil on the ninth part of her hair. Have you indentures, Rob? Shall we be gone? The moon shines fair. You may away by night. I'll haste the return, and we'll all break with your wives of your departure and... Fie, cousin Percy, how you cross my father. I cannot choose. Sometimes he angers me. We're telling me of the mould warp and the ant, of the dreamer Merlin and his prophecies, and such a deal of skimble scamble stuff has pushed me from my faith. I tell you what, he held me last night at least nine hours <laughs> in reckoning up the several devil's names that were his lackeys. I cried, Oh, and well, go to. <laughs> but marked him not a word. Oh, he's as tedious as a tired horse. A railing wife. I'd rather live with cheese and garlic in a windmill far than feed on cakes and have him talk to me. <laughs> in faith, he is a worthy gentleman, exceedingly well read and profited in strange concealments, valiant as a lion and wondrous affable, bountiful as mines of India. Shall I tell you, cousin? He holds your temper in a high respect. I warrant you that man is not alive, might so have tempted him as you have done. In faith, my lord, you are too willful blame. And since your coming hither have done enough to put him quite besides his patience, you must needs learn, lord, to amend this fault. Though sometimes it shows greatness, courage, blood, and that's the dearest grace it renders you, yet oftentimes it doth present harsh rage, defect of manners, want of government, Pride, haughtiness, opinion, and disdain, the least of which, haunting a nobleman, loseth men's hearts and leaves behind a stain upon the beauty of all parts besides, beguiling them of commendation. Well, I'm schooled. <laughs> Good manners be your speed. A train! Here come our wives, let's take our leave. I'd a flower this Oh, love, Gary had your yanks see more than Rodgers. Hey, young Terry Heenan, find me the fellow. This is the deadly spite that angers me. My wife can speak no English and I no Welsh. <laughs> My daughter weeps. She will not part with you. She'll be a soldier too. She'll to the war. Good father, tell her that she and my sister Percy shall follow in your conduct speedily. I go with you, Governor. Could ye a fire of ride the lean and carry on? Dillin, it will be. Dillin, you You did that me, I had no gang, I no love right there. Can I let him in the stuffy in the wood I'm mystery? You never log over. You tear with no joy skin him hell on it. Get a dun young, it doesn't make a sigh. Oh, pardon me, dear fellow. No, she is desperate here. A peevish, self willed harlotry, one that no persuasion can do good upon. The merch. Now deem thy own knee or unvoddle and ruin ma. Bernard, my dean and I'm ready to trust feed back on, and I do what I best do. Do what? Did the man catch you now? Did the man? No, he didn't get it all. No, get him at all, pan run. He be a girl and rush on a dan word, nay gno eskirn de wishyanti vlanedig. I'll at go for dune to within our wogi, and need to ingo with you, or dan our hand revn. Kovia, de ask at you vach. Nay, eat. Yon carriad. Yon dada. Oh, do. Unwilled. Can I go to the body? Can I be in this ridiculous state? The lies are the right one. Got up a claw and went for no bite. Got up a dress and got no knee. Made Adel demon. I understand thy looks. That pretty Welsh that thou pourest from these swollen heavens. I am too perfect in. 
And but for shame in such a parley should I answer thee. I still am sorry of you. I lie, Varu. Fatly. God, I'm hardly worthless. On an urban dominion of Bangalon. Mohan and in Glai an hour. Neither were a nod was go by. I'm thinking it's more badly forth. I understand thy kisses and are mine. And that's a feeling disputation. And I shall never be a true and love until I learn thy language. For thy tongue makes Welsh as sweet as ditties highly penned. And sung by a fair queen in a summer's bower, with ravishing division to her lute. Nay, nay, if you melt, then will she run mad. Now they gone. Now they gone, but I've never been made now. Patrin, come in. Come in, me. Lord of Ben Van Wheelit, I've hung hole. I can't have gone, he left me to freed. And this moist. I am ignorance itself in this. She bids you on the wanton rushes lay you down and rest your gentle head upon her lap. And she will sing the song that pleaseth you. With all my heart I'll sit and hear her sing. <laughs> By that time will our book, I think, be drawn. Do so. And those musicians that shall play to you hang in the air one thousand leagues from hence and straight. Ha <laughs> ha! They shall be here. Sit! Come, kid. Thou art perfect in lying down. Go quick, quick! For I may lay my head in thy lap. Goose, kitty goose! And attend! Can of Gan, a gayaf. Can a gayaf, a song of winter. Perceive the devil understands Welsh. It is no marvel he's so humorous. By a lady, he's a good musician. Then should you be nothing but musical, for you are altogether governed by humours. If still ye thief and hear the lady singing well. I'd rather a lady me brack howling Irish. Wouldst thou have thy head broken? No. Then be still. Neither. It is a woman's fault. Now, God help thee. To the Welsh lady's bed. Good advice makes a man a coward. <laughs> Come, kid. I'll have your song, too. Not mine in good sooth. Not yours in good sooth? 
Oh, you swear like a comfort maker's wife. Not you in good sooth. Swear me, Kate, like a lady as thou art, a good mouth-filling oath. And leave in sooth the velvet guards and Sunday citizens. Come, say. I will not see. And the indentures be drawn all away within these two hours. So come in when you will. Come. Come, Lord Mortimer. You are as slow as hot young Percy is on fire to go. By this, our book is drawn. We'll but see you, and then to horse immediately. With all my heart. Aye. Or for the liai, tagrai, the guide thoi and aros kadani, kanam the blani. Amid, pray the way on. I know not whether God will have it so for some displeasing service I have done. But in his secret doom, out of my blood, he'll breed repentment and a scourge for me. But thou dost in thy passages of life. Make me believe that thou art only marked for the hot vengeance and the rod of heaven to punish my mistreatings. Tell me else, could such inordinate and low desires, such barren pleasures and low society as thou art matched with all and grafted to, Keep company with the greatness of thy blood, and hold their level with thy princely heart. So please, your majesty, I would I could quit all offenses with as clear excuse, as well as I am doubtless I can purge myself of many I am charged with all. Yet such extenuation let me beg, as in disproof of many tales devised, which of the ears of greatness needs must hear by smiling pick thanks and base newsmongers, I may, for some things true, or in my youth hath faulty, wandered, and irregular, find pardon on my true submission. God pardon thee. Yet let me wonder, Harry, at thy affections, which shall hold a wing quite from the flight of all thy ancestors. Thy place in council thou hast rudely lost, which by thy younger brother is supplied, and art almost an alien to the hearts of all the court and princes of my blood. The hope and expectation of thy time is ruined. And the soul of every man prophetically do forethink thy fall. Had I so lavish of my presence been, so stale and cheap to vulgar company, so common hackneyed in the eyes of men, opinion that it helped me to the crown, but still kept loyal to possession, and left me in reputeless banishment, a fellow of no mark or likelihood. By being seldom seen, I could not stir, but like a comet I was wondered at. That men would tell their children, this is he. Others say, where? Which is Bolingbroke? And then I stole all courtesy from heaven, and dressed myself in such humility, that I did pluck allegiance from men's hearts, loud shouts and salutations from their mouths, even in the presence of the crowned king. Thus did I keep my person fresh and new. The skipping Richard ambled up and down with shallow jesters and rash babbing wits. Mingle his royalty with capering fools, and his great name profaned with their scorns. Grow a companion to the common streets, infect himself to popularity. But when he had occasion to be seen, he was but as the cuckoo is in June, heard not regarded. Seen but with such eyes as sick and blunted with community, afford no extraordinary gaze. And in that very line, Harry, standest thou. For thou hast lost thy princely privilege with vile participation. Not an eye but is a weary of thy common sight. 
so it might. Which hath desired to see thee more. And does that now, I would not have it do. Makes blind itself with foolish tenderness. I shall hereafter, my thrice gracious lord, be more myself. For all the world as thou art to this hour, was Richard then when I from France an exile home returned. And even as I was then is Percy now. Now oh, by my scepter and my soul to boot, he hath more worthy interest to the state than thou, the shadow of succession. But never dying honor hath he won against renowned and Douglas. Thrice hath this Hotspur, Mars in swaddling clothes, this infant warrior, in his enterprises discomfited great Douglas, chained him once, enlarged him and made a friend of him, to fill the mouth of deep defiance up and shake the power and safety of our throne. What say you to this? Hmm? Percy, Northumberland, the Archbishop Grace of York, Douglas and Lord Mortimer capitulate against us and are up. Wherefore should I tell these news to thee, that art my nearest and my dearest enemy? Thou, that art lucky enough through vassal fear to fight against me and the Percy's pay to show how much thou art a general. Do not think so. You shall not find it so. God forgive them that have so much turned your majesty's good thoughts away from me. I will redeem all this on Percy's heads. And in the closing of some glorious day, be bold to tell you that I am your son. And I shall wear a garment all of blood and stain my favors in a bloody mask which washed away shall scour my shame with it. And that shall be the day when there it lights that this same child of honor and renown, this gallant hot spur, this old place at night in your have thought of any chance to meet. For every honor sitting on his helm, would they were multitudes, and on my head my shame's redoubled. For the time will come that I will make this northern youth exchange his glorious deeds for my indignities. Percy is but my factor, good my lord, to engross up glorious deeds on my behalf. And I will call him in so strict account that he shall render every honor up, yea, even the slightest worship of his time. And I will tear the reckoning from his heart. It's in the name of God I promise here, which if he be pleased I shall perform, if not the end of life cancels all bonds. And I will die a hundred thousand deaths ere break the smallest parcel of this vow. A hundred thousand rebels die in this. Thou shalt have charge and sovereign trust herein. Ah, now, good blunt. My looks are full of speed. So hath the business that I come to speak of. From Scotland, word hath come from Lord Dunbar that Douglas and the English rebels met. The 11th of this month at Shrewsbury, a, a mighty and a fearful head they are. The Earl of Westmoreland set forth today with my son, Lord John of Lancaster. On Wednesday next, Harry, shalt thou set forward. On Thursday, we ourselves will march. Our meeting is Bridge North. Our hands are full of business. Come, let's away. Advantage feeds him fat while men delay.
since this last action? Do I not bait? Do I not dwindle? Why my skin hangs about me like an old lady's loose garden? I am withered like an old apple, John. Well, I'll repent me in that suddenly while I'm in some liking. And I have not forgotten what the inside of a church is made of. I am a peppercorn. A brewer's horse, the inside of a church, company, villainous company have been the spoil of me. Why, Sir John, you are so fretful you cannot live long. There it is. Come play me a bawdy tune, make me merry. <laughs> Virtuously given as any gentleman need be. Well, virtuous enough. I swore little. Dice not above seven times. A week. <laughs> Went to a bawdy house not above once. In a quarter of an hour. <laughs> Paid money that I borrowed three or four times lived well and in good compass, and now I live out of all order, out of all compass. Why, Sir John, you are so fat. You cannot choose but be out of all compass, out of all reasonable compass, Sir John. <laughs> Do thou amend thy face, and I'll amend my life. Thou art our admiral, thou bearest thy lantern in the poop, but is in the nose of thee. Thou art the knight of the burning lamp. Why, Sir John, my face does you no harm. No, I'll be sworn, I make as much use of it as many a man doth of a death's head or a memento mori. I cannot look upon thy face without thinking of hellfire. Burning! Burning! When thou ranst up Gads Hill in the night to catch my horse, if I did not think thou had been an igneous fatuous, or a ball of wild fire, there's no purchase in money. Thou art a perpetual triumph, an everlasting bonfire light. Thou hast saved me a thousand marks in links and torches, walking with thee at night, twixt tavern and tavern. But the sack thou hast drunk me would have bought me lamps as good, Cheap at the dearest chandlers in Europe. Splurge. God reward me for it. I would my face were in your belly. God of mercy, so shall I be sure to be harboured. <laughs> oh no, Dame Hart at the head. Have you inquired yet who picked my puppy? Why, Sir John, what do you think, Sir John? Do you think I keep thieves in my house? I have searched. I have inquired, so has my husband, man by man, boy by boy, servant by servant. The time of a hair was never lost in my house before. Yeah, well, I host this off was shaved and lost many a hair. Oh. And I'll be sworn my pocket was picked. Go to! You're a woman. Go. Who I? Nay, I defy thee. God's light, I've never been called so in mine own house before. No, too, I know you well enough. No, Sir John, you do not know me, Sir John. I know you, Sir John. You owe me money, Sir John. And now you pick a quarrel to beguile me of it. I bought you a dozen of shirts to your back. Dullness, filthy dullness. Oh. I gave them away to baker's wives. They made bolters of them. Now, as I am an honest woman, Holland of eight shillings an ale, 
You owe me money here besides, Sir John, for your diet and by drinking, and money lent you four and twenty pound. He had his part in it, let him pay. He? Oh, alas, he is poor. He hath nothing. Oh, poor? Look upon his face. What call you rich? Let them coin his cheeks. Let them coin his nose. I'll not pay a denier. What will you make a yonkel of me? Shall a man not take it as easy as in without having his pockets picked? I have lost the seal ring of my grandfather's <laughs> worth 40 marks. Jeez, you I've heard the prince tell him I don't know how off that that ring was copper. Oh, the prince is a jack, a sneaker. Splut anywhere here and would say so. <laughs> I would cudgel him like a dog. <laughs> Ah. Oh. Oh. Ah, is the news in that quarter, Faith? Must we all march? I pray you, my lord, hear me. What sayest thou to me, mistress? Quickly, how doth my husband? I love him well. He's an honest man. Good, my lord, hear me. I pray the letter alone and listen to me. What sayest thou to me, Jack? The other night I fell asleep here behind the arras and had my pocket picked. Oh. This house is turned boarding house. They pick pockets. What is thou lose, Jack? Much thou believe three or four bonds worth... Forty mark apiece and a seal ring of my grandfather's. A trifle, some eight penny, madam. Well, so I told, told him, my lord, and I said I heard your grace say so. Mm. And my lord, he speaks most vilely of you, like a foul-mouthed man as he is. And he said he would cudgel you. But he did not. There's neither faith, truth, nor womanhood in me else. There's no more faith in thee than in a stewed prune. Oh. Oh. And no more truth in thee than in a drawn fox. And as for womanhood, ha, go, ya thing, go. Say, what thing? What thing? What thing? Why, a thing to thank God on. I am nothing to thank God on. I wouldst thou shouldst know it. I'm an honest man's wife. And setting thy knighthood aside, thou art a knave to call me so. Setting thy womanhood aside, thou art a beast to say otherwise. <clears throat> say, what beast, thou knave, thou? What beast? Why, an otter. <laughs> an otter, Sir John? Why an otter? <laughs> Why? She's neither fish nor flesh, a man knows not where to have her. Oh, oh thou art an unjust man in saying so. Thou and any man knows where to have me, thou knave, thou. Thou sayest true, host, as he slanders thee most grossly. Well, so he doth you, my lord, and he said the other day you ought him a thousand pounds. Oh, Sarah, do I owe you a thousand pounds? A thousand pounds? A million half. Thou owest me thy love, thy love is worth a million. Nay, my lord, he called you Jack. Said he would cudgel you. Did I, Bardolph? Yes, indeed, Sir John, you said so. <laughs> he said my ring was copper. Yeah, I say tis copper. Darest thou be so good as thy word now? By how thou knowest that thou art a man, I dare. But as thou art a true prince, I fear thee like I fear the roaring of a lion's whelp. Oh, and why not as the lion? The king himself is to be feared as the lion. Dost think I fear thee like I fear thy father? And I do, I pray God, my girdle break. Oh, if he did, how would thy guts fall about thy knees? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but sinner, there's no room for faith or truth or honesty in this bosom of thine. It's all filled up with guts and midriff. <laughs> and charge an honest woman with picking of thy pocket by a wholesome, impudent, embossed rascal. If there were anything in thy pocket, but tavern records, memorandums of boarding houses, and one poor pennyworth of sugar candy to make thee long-winded, I am a villain. Art thou not ashamed? Thou hear how, in the state of innocency, Adam fell. What should poor Jack Falstaff do in the days of villainy? Thou seest I have more flesh than any other man, and therefore more frailty. You confess, then, you picked my pocket. It appears so. <laughs> Hostess, I forgive thee. <laughs> Go make 
ready my breakfast. Love thy husband. Oh, no. <laughs> Look to thy servants, cherish thy guests. You shall find me tractable to any honest reason. You see, I am pacified, boom, boom, still. Ah, I prithee be gone. Oh. Now, Hal, to the news of court. Uh, About the robbery, lad. How is that answered? Oh, my sweet bee, if I must still be good angel to thee, the money's all paid back again. Oh, I like not that paying back. Tis a double labour. Well, I am good friends with my father and may do anything. Rub me the exchequer first thing thou dost. I do. Now, procure thee, Jack, a charge of foot. Uh, would it have been a horse? <laughs> but up uh, yours out, I know. Uh, bear this letter to Lord John of Lancaster. Yeah, to, to my brother John, this to my Lord of Westmoreland. I come, Peter, to a horse, for thou and I have thirty miles to ride at dinner time, Jack. See tomorrow in the Temple Hall at two o'clock in the afternoon. That shall bundle thy charge, and there receive money and order for their furniture. The land is burning. Percy stands on high. And either we or they must know a lie. Rare words. Brave world. Hostess, my breakfast, come! Oh, I could wish this tavern were my drum. <laughs> Said my noble Scott, if speaking truth in this fine age were not thought flattering, such attribution should the Douglas have, as not a soldier of this season stamps your go as general current through the world. Nay, test me to my word, approve me, Lord. Thou art the king of honour. No man so potent breeds upon the earth, but I will bear them. Do so, and tis well. <laughs> What letter is that there? I can't well thank you. His letters from your father. Letters from him? Why comes he not himself? He cannot come, my lord. He's grievous sick. Soon's I was in the leisure to be sick in such a jostling time. Who brings his power under whose government come there long? His letters bear his mind, not I, my lord. I pray you tell me not to keep his bed. He did, my lord, four days ere I set forth. And at the time of my departure, he was much feared by his physicians. Oh, would the state of time had first been whole ere he by sickness had been visited? His health was never better worse than now. Sick now? Droop now? This sickness doth infect the very lifeblood of our enterprise. It's catching hither even to our camp. He writes me here that inward sickness and that his friends by deputation could not so soon be drawn. Nor did he think it meet to lay so dangerous and dear a trust on any so removed but on his own. Yet do they give us bold advertisement that with our small conjunction we should on to see how fortune is disposed to us for as he writes. There's no quailing now, because the king is certainly possessed of all our purposes. What say you to it? Your father's sickness is a maim to us. A perilous gash. A very limb lopped off. And yet in faith it is not. His present want seems more than we shall find it. <coughs> Were it good to set the exact wealth of all our states all at one cast? Eh? Huh? To set so rich a man on the nice hazard of one doubtful hour. It were not good. For therein should we read the very bottom and the soul of hope. The very list, the very utmost bound of all our purposes. Faith, and so we should. Well, now remains a sweet reversion. We may boldly spend upon the hope of what is to come in. A ah, comfort of retirement lives in there. A rendezvous. Aye. A home to fly unto us that the devil and mischance look big upon the maidenhead of our affairs. Aye. Yet I would your father had been here. The quality and hair of our attempt brooks no division. It will be thought by some that know not why he is away that wisdom, loyalty, and mere dislike of our proceedings kept the earl from hence. And think how such an apprehension may turn the tide of fearful faction and breed a kind of question in our cause. For well you know, we of the offering side must keep aloof from strict arbitrament and stop wall sight holes. 
Every loop from whence the eye of reason may pry in on us. This absence of your father's draws a curtain that shows the ignorant a kind of fear before not dreamt of. You strain too far. I rather of his absence make this use. It lends a luster and more great opinion. A larger dare to our great enterprise than if the earl were here. The men must think. If we without his help can make a head to push against a kingdom. With his help we shall all journey jumpsy jerry down. Yet all goes well. Yet all the joints are whole. That's hard to think. There's no term spoke of in Scotland as this word of fear. My cousin Vernon. Welcome by my sword. Pray God my news be worth a welcome, Lord. The Earl of Westmoreland, 7,000 strong, is marching hitherwards. With him, Prince John. No harm. What more? And further I've learned the king himself in person is set forth. Or hitherwards intended speedily with strong and mighty preparation. He shall be welcome too. <laughs> Where's his son? That nimble-footed madcap prince of Wales and his companions that duff the world aside and bid it pass. All furnished, all in arms, all plumed like estridges, that with the wind baited like eagles having lately bathed, glittering in golden coats like images, as full of spirit as the month of May and gorgeous as the sun at midsummer, wanton as youthful goats, wild as young bulls. I saw young Hannah. With his beaver on, his crushes on his thighs, gallantly armed, rise from the ground like feathered mercury, and vaulted with such ease into his seat, as if an angel dropped down from the clouds to turn and wind a fiery Pegasus, and witch the world with noble horsemanship. No more. No more. Worse than the sun in March, this praise doth nourish Aegeus. Let them come. They come like sacrifices in their trim. And to the fire-eyed maid of smoky war, all oh, hot and bleeding, will we offer them. The mailed marshal on his altar sit up to the ears in blood. Oh, I'm on fire to hear this rich reprisely so nigh and yet not ours come. Let me taste my horse. Harry to Harry shall hot horse to horse meet on their part till one drop down a course. Oh, the Glendower will come. There is more news. I learned in Worcester as I rode along. He cannot draw his power these 14 days. That's the worst tidings that I hear of yet. Aye, by my faith, it bears a frosty sound. What may the king's whole battle reach unto? To 30,000. Forty, let it be. My father and Glendower being both away, the powers of us may serve so great a day. Come, let's take a muster speedily. Doomsday is near, die all, die merrily. Talk not of dying, for I am out of fear of death or death's hand this one half year. Sir Michael! Go good, Sir Michael. Bear this sealed brief with winged haste to the Lord Marshal. Now this to my cousin Scroop and all the rest to whom they are directed. If you knew how much they do import, you would make haste. My lord, I guess their tenor. Like enough you do. Tomorrow, good Sir Michael, is a day wherein the fortune of ten thousand men must bide the touch. For, sir, at Shrewsbury, as I'm truly given to understand, the king, with mighty and quick-raised power, meets with Lord Harry. And I fear, Sir Michael, what with the sickness of Northumberland, what with Owen Glendower's absence thence, I fear the power of Percy is too weak to wage an instant trial with the king. Why, my good lord, you need not fear. There is Douglas and Lord Mortimer. No, Mortimer is not there. But there is also Vernon, Lord Harry Percy, and there is my lord of Worcester, and a head of gallant warriors, noble gentlemen. So there is, and yet the king hath drawn the special head of all the land together. The Prince of Wales, Lord John of Lancaster, noble Westmoreland, <laughs> and warlike blunt. Doubt not, my lord, they shall be well opposed. I hope no less. 
Yet needful tis to fear, and to prevent the worst, Sir Michael, speed. For if Lord Harry thrive not, ere the king dismiss his power, he means to visit us. For he hath heard of our confederacy. Therefore make haste. I must go right again to other friends. So farewell, Sir Michael. We'll fight with him tonight. It may not be. Ah, you give him an advantage. Not a whit. Why say you so? Look, see not for supply. So do we. Is it certain? Ours is doubtful. Good cousin, be advised. Stir not tonight. Do not, my lord. You do not counsel well. You speak it out of fear and cold heart. Do me no slander, Douglas. By my life, I hold as little counsel with weak fear as you, my lord, or any Scot that this day lives. Let it be seen tomorrow. In the battle, which of us fierce? Ye or tonight. Content. Aye. Tonight, say I. Come, come, and may not be. I wonder much, being men of such great leading as you are, that you foresee not what impediments drag back our expedition. Certain horse, or my cousin Morton's, are not yet come up. Your uncle Worcester's horse came but today, and now their pride and metal is asleep. Their courage with hard labour, tame and dull. They're not a horse as half the half himself. So are the horses of the enemy, in general journey bid in a broad law. The better part of us are full of rest. The number of the kings exceedeth ours. For God's sake, cousin, stay till all come in. My lord! I come with gracious offers from the king, if you vouchsafe me hearing and respect. Welcome, Sir Walter Blood. And what to God, you were of our determination. The king has sent to know the nature of your griefs, and whereupon you conjure from the breast of civil peace such bold hostility, teaching his duteous land audacious cruelty. He bids you name your griefs, and with all speed you shall have your desires with interest, and pardon, absolute, for yourselves and these, herein misled by your suggestion. The king is kind, and well we know the king knows at what time the promise went to pay. My father, and my uncle, and myself, did give him that same royalty he wears. And when he was not six and twenty strong, a poor, unminded outlaw sneaking home, my father gave him welcome to the shore. And when he heard him swear and vow to God, he came but to be Duke of Lancaster. My father, in kind heart and pity move, swore him assistance and performed it too. I came not to hear this. Then to the point. In short time after, he deposed the king. Soon after that, deprived him of his life. To make that worse, so for his kinsman March, who is, if every owner were well placed indeed, his king to be engaged in Wales, there without ransom, the like forfeited, disgrace me in my happy victories, sought to entrap me by intelligence, rated mine uncle from the council board, in rage dismissed my father from the court, broke oath on oath, committed wrong on wrong, and in conclusion, drove us to seek out this head of safety. And with all the pride to his title, the which we find too indirect for long continuance. Shall I return this answer to the king? Not so, Sir Walter. We'll withdraw a while. Let there be informed some surety for a safe return again. And in the morning early shall my uncle bring him our purposes. So farewell. I would you would accept of grace and love. Maybe so we shall. Pray God you do. Thank <laughs> you.
before the Coventry and fill me a bottle of sack. Our soldiers will march through. We'll do um, Sutton Coldfield tonight. Will you give me some money, Captain? Lay out, lay out. Well, this bottle comes to ten shillings. I'll answer the coinage. A bit Lieutenant Peto meet me at Townsend. I will, my Captain. Fare you well. I be not ashamed of my soldiers. I'm a soused gurnet. I have misused the king's press damnably. I press me none but good householders, yeoman sons, and cry me out contracted bachelors, and such a commodity of warm slaves as would as leave here the devil as the drum, with hearts in their bellies no bigger than pins' heads. And they have bought out their services. And now my whole charge consists of ancients, corporals, Slaves as ragged as Lazarus in the painted cloth, where the glutton's dogs licks his sores, and such as were never soldiers but unjust, discarded serving men. Younger sons to younger brothers, revolted tapsters, ostlers trade fallen, the cankers of a calm world and a long peace. A mad fellow met me on the way and told me I'd unloaded all the gibbets and pressed the dead bodies. <laughs> May I have ne'er seen such scarecrows. I'll not march through Coventry with them, and that's flat. There's not a shirt and a half in the whole company. And a half shirt is two napkins tacked together, thrown over the shoulders like a herald's coat without sleeves. And to say the truth, the whole shirt was stolen from the red-nosed innkeeper at Daventry. <laughs> Well, that's all one. They'll find linen enough in every hedge, eh? <laughs> Who comes oh, here? Brown Jack! Oh, oh no, Quilt! No, hell! Oh. How no, mad wag! What the devil dost thou in Warwickshire? My good lord of Westmoreland, I cry your mercy. I thought your lordship had already been at Shrewsbury. Faith, Sir John, it's more than time that I were there, and you too. But my powers are there already. The king, I can tell you, looks for us all. We must away all night. Tut, tut. I was vigilant as a cat to steal cream. Yeah, I think to steal cream, indeed, when thy theft hath already made thee butter. <laughs> <laughs> but, Jack, whose fellows are these that uh, come after? Oh, mine, Hal, mine. <clears throat> I did never see such pitiful rascals. Tut, tut. Good enough to toss, eh? Food for powder, food for powder. <laughs> They'll fill a pit as well as better tush, man. Mortal men, mortal men. I, Mr. John, me thinks are exceeding poor and bare. Too beggarly. As for their poverty, I know not where they got that. And for their bareness, I am sure they never learned that of me. No, I'll be sworn, unless you call three fingers in the ribs bare. But Sarah, make haste. Percy's already in the field. I fear we stay too long. What is the king and Catholic? Why then, to the latter end of a fray, and the beginning of a feast, fits a dull fighter and a keen guest. Come on here, come on here. The big one, let's go, come on here. Uh. Now, bloodily the sun begins to peep above yon bosky hill. The day looks pale at his distemperature. The southern wind that played a trumpet to his purposes. And with his hollow whistling in the leaves foretells a tempest and a blustering day. Then with the loser let him sympathize. For nothing can seem foul to those that win. Oh no, my lord of Worcester. It is not well that you and I should meet upon such terms as now we meet. You have deceived our trust. And made us doff our easy robes of peace. And crush our old limbs in ungentle steel. This is not well, my lord, this is not well. What say you to it? Hear you, my liege. For mine own part, I could be well content to entertain the lag end of my life in quiet hours. For I protest, I have not sought the day of this dislike. You have not sought it? Well, how comes it then? Rebellion lay in his way, and he found it. Please, Chewy, please. <laughs> it pleased your majesty to turn your looks of friendship from myself and all our house. And yet I must remember you, my lord, we were the first and dearest of your friends. 
It was myself, my brother, and my nephew that brought you home. You swore to us, and you did swear the oath at Doncaster, that you did nothing purpose against the state, nor claim no further than your new fallen right, the seat of Gaunt, dukedom of Lancaster. To this we swore our aid. But in short space, it rained down fortune, showering on your head, and such a flood of greatness fell on you. What with our help, what with the absent king, you took occasion to be quickly wooed, to gripe the general sway in your hand. And being fed by us, you used us so, as that ungentle gull, the cuckoo's bird, useth the sparrow, did oppress our nest, grew by our feeding to so great a bulk that even our love durst not come near your sight for fear of swallowing. But with nimble wing we were enforced for safety's sake to fly out of your sight and raise this present head, whereby we stand opposed by such means as you yourself have forged against yourself by unkind usage, dangerous countenance, and violation of all faith and truth. These things indeed you have articulate. Proclaimed at market crosses, read in churches, to face the garment of rebellion with some fine colour that may please the eye. And never yet did insurrection want such watercolours to impaint its cause. Nor moody beggars, starving for a time of pell mell havoc and confusion. The Prince of Wales doth join with all the world in praise of Henry Percy. By my hopes, I do not think a braver gentleman, more daring or more bold, is now alive. But for my part, I may speak it to my shame, I have a truant been to chivalry. Yet this before my father's majesty. I am content that he shall take the odds of his great name and estimation and will to save the blood on either side. Try fortune with him in a single fight. We love our people well. Even those we love that are misled upon your cousin's part. And they will take the offer of our grace. He, they, you, yea, every man. Shall be my friend again and I'll be his. So tell your cousin. And bring us word what he will do. But if he will not yield. Rebuke and dread correction wait on us. And they shall do their office. So get you gone. We would not now be troubled with reply. We offer fair. Take it advisedly. Now, we will not be accepted on my life. The Douglas and the Hotspur both together are confident against the world in arms. Then stare for every leader to his charge. And God befriend us. For our cause is just. Hal, if you see me down in battle, bestride me thus. Hmm? Tis a point of friendship. Nothing but a colossus can do thee that friendship. <laughs> Say thy prayers and farewell. I would to a bedtime, Hal, and all well. Why, thou owest God a death. Tis not you yet. I would be loath to pay him before his day. Why need I be so forward with him that calls not on me? Hmm? Well, it is no matter. Honor pricks me on. Yea, but how if honor prick me off when I am come on? Hmm? What then? Can honor set to a leg? No. Or an arm? No. Or take away the grief of a wound? No. Honor hath no skill in surgery then? No. What is honor? A word. Yes, but what is in that word honor? What is that honor? Air. A trim reckoning. <laughs> Who hath it? He that died a Wednesday. <laughs> Doth he feel it? No. Doth he hear it? No. Tis insensible then, yea, to the dead. But doth it not live with the living? No. Why? Detraction will not suffer it. Therefore, I'll have none of it. Honor is a mere scutcheon. And so ends my catechism. <laughs> oh, no. My
My nephew must not know, Sir Richard, the liberal and kind offer of the king. To our best he did. Then are we all undone. It is not possible. It cannot be the king will keep his word in loving us. He will suspect us still and find a time to punish this offence in other faults. Suspicion all our lives shall be stuffed full of eyes. For treason is but trusted as the fox. Look how we can, or sad or merrily, interpretation shall misquote our looks. And we shall feed like oxen at the stall, the better cherish still the nearer death. My nephew's trespass may be well forgot, it had the excuse of youth and heat of blood. All his offences live upon my head and on his father's, we did train him on. And his corruption being tamed from us, we as the spring of all must pay for all. Therefore, Sir Richard, let not Harry know in any case the offer of the king. Deliver what you will. I'll see it as soon. My own college return. Deliver up my lord of Westmoreland. Uncle, what news? The king will bid you battle presently. We're defiant by the lord of Westmoreland. Lord Douglas, who are you and tell him so? Marry and shall, and very willingly. There is no seeming mercy in the king. Did you beg any God forbid? Well, I told him gently of our grievances, of his oath-breaking, which he mended thus by now forswearing that he is forsworn. He calls us rebels, Get. traitors, and will scourge with haughty arms that hateful name in us. Arm, gentlemen, to arms, for I have thrown a brave defiance in King Henry's teeth. The Prince of Wales stepped forth before the king, and nephew challenged you to single fight. Oh, would the quarrel lay upon our heads? And that no man might draw short breath today but I and Harry Monmouth. Tell me, tell me, how short is Tuscan? Seemed him in contempt. No. By my soul, I never in my life did hear a challenge urge more modestly. He gave you all the duties of a man, trimmed up your praises with a princely tongue, and which became him like a prince indeed. He made a blushing cycle of himself and chid his truant youth with such a grace as if he mastered there a double spirit of teaching and of learning instantly. Then did he pause. But let me tell the world, if he outlived the envy of this day, England did never own so sweet a hope, so much misconstrued in his wantonness. Cousin, I think thou art enamoured on his follies. <laughs> Never did I hear of any prince so wild a liberty. But be as he will. Yet once a night I will embrace him with a soldier's arm. That he shall shrink under my courtesy. Arm! Arm with speed and fellows. Soldiers. Friends. Better consider what you have to do. Then I that have not well the gift of tongue can lift your blood up with persuasion. My lord, these letters are for you. I cannot read them now. Oh, gentlemen, the time of life is short. To spend that shortness basely were too long. If life did ride upon a dial's point still ending at the arrival of an hour. And if we live... We live the tread on kings. Aye. If die, brave death when princes die with us. My lord, prepare. The king comes on apace. I thank him that he cuts me from me to for a profess not talking. <laughs> Only this. Let each man do his best. And here draw I a sword. Whose temper I intend to stain with the best blood that I can meet with all in the adventure of this perilous day. Now, Esperance! Percy and Sedan! Sound all the lofty instruments of war, and by that music, let us all embrace. For heaven to earth, some of us never shall a second time do such a courtesy. Yes! What is thy name, that in the battle thus thou trustest me? Know then my name is Douglas, and I do haunt thee in the battle thus, for some do tell me that thou art a king. They tell thee true. 
The Lord of Stafford Peel today has bought thy likeness. But instead of thee, King Harry, this sword hath ended him. So shall it be. Unless thou yield thee as my prisoner. I was not born a yielder, thou proud Scot. And thou shalt find a king that will revenge Lord Stafford's death! Muffins where they are peppered. There's not three of my hundred and fifty left alive. And they're to the town's end to beg during life. Oh. It comes here. Oh, uh, what's that uh, the idol here? Uh, Let me like slow horns. Oh, I pray they give me leave to breathe a while. Sir Gregory never did such deeds in battle that I have done this day. I have paid Percy. I have made him sure. There is indeed a living to kill me. I pray thee lend my sword. What if Percy be alive? Thou gets not my sword, but here take my pistol if thou wilt. Come, give it me. What is it in the case? Ah, hell, tis hot, tis hot. There's that will sack a city. Oh. Is it a time to jest and dally now? Well, if Percy be alive, I'll pierce him so, if he do come in my way. <laughs> if I do come in his willingly, let them make a carbonado of me. I like not such grinning on earth Sir Walter hath. Give me life, which if I can save, so if not, honor comes unlooked for. And there's an end. <laughs> I pray thee, Harry, withdraw thyself, thou bleeds too much. Ah. Lord John of Lancaster, go ah. you with him. Well, I, my lord, unless I did bleed too. Come, my lord, I leave you to your tent. Believe me, my lord, I do not need your help. And God forbid a shallow scratch to drive a prince of Wales from such a field as this. It breathes too long, our duty this way lies. Come, cousin Westmoreland, for God's sake, come. Oh, by God, thou hast deceived me, Lancaster. I did not think thee, lord, of such a spirit. Before I loved thee as a brother John, but now I do respect thee as my soul. Another king? They go like Hydra's heads. I am the Douglas, fatal to all those who wear those colors on them. What art thou that counterfeits the person of a king? The king himself, who Douglas grieves at heart. So many of his shadows thou hast met. And not the very king. But since thou forced on me so luckily, I will assay thee. Defend myself. <laughs> Fear thou art another counterfeit. And yet in faith thou bearest thee like a king. 
mine, I'm sure thou art too, ere thou be. And thus, I win thee! Percy and the Prince of Wales. Oh, shall it, Harry? For the hour is come to end the one of us. And would to God thy name and arms when I was clear as mine. I'll make it greater that I part from thee. And all the budding honours on thy crest I'll crop to make a garland for my head. I can no longer brook thy vanity. Yeah. Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. A better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. They wound my thoughts. Worse than thy sword, my flesh. But thoughts the slaves of life. And life, time's fool. And time that takes away of all the world must have a stop. Oh. Oh. I could prophesy. But that the earthy and cruel hand of death lies on my tongue. No, Percy. 
Thou art dust. And food for whoop. The worms. Brave Percy. Very well, great heart. Ill weed the ambition. How much of thou shrunk? When that this body contain a spirit, a kingdom for it was too small a bound. Now, two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. This earth that bears thee dead, bears not alive so stout a gentleman. If thou wert sensible of courtesy, I would not make so dear a show of zeal. And let my favours, I thy mangled face. And you, and take thy praise with thee to heaven. What? Old acquaintance? Could not all this flesh keep in a little life? Poor Jack, well, I could have better spared a better man. I should have a heavy miss of thee if I were much in love with vanity. And bowed will I see thee by and by. Till then in blood, thy noble Percy lie. In bowed? If thou embowel me today, I'll give you leave to powder me and eat me tomorrow's blood. It was time to counterfeit, or that hot termagant Scot would have paid me Scot and Lot too. The better part of valour is discretion. In the which better part I have saved my life. <laughs> I'm afraid of this gunpowder Percy, though he be dead. How if he should rise and counterfeit too? Splud. I'm afraid he will prove the better counterfeit, therefore I'll make him sure and swear I killed him. Why may not he rise as well as I? Hmm? Nothing confutes me but eyes and nobody sees. Therefore, Sarah. With a new wound in thy thigh. And come along with me. Ever did rebellion find rebuke? Ill spirited Worcester, did we not send grace, pardon, and our love to all of you? And wouldst thou turn our upper country? Three knights upon our party slain today, a noble earl and many a creature else, have been alive this hour. But like a Christian that has truly borne betwixt our armies true intelligence. What I have done, my safety urged me to, and I embrace my fortune patiently, since not to be avoided it falls on me. Bear Worcester to the death. Other offenders we will pause upon. How goes the field? The noble Scot, Lord Douglas, when he saw the fortune of the day quite turned from him, the noble Percy slain, and all his followers upon the foot of fear fled with the rest, and falling from a hill he was so bruised that the pursuers took him. Of my tender Douglas is, and I beseech your grace, I may dispose of him. With all my heart, and brother John of Lancaster, do you go to the Douglas and deliver him up to his pleasure, ransomless and free. His valour shone upon our crest today. 
have taught us how to cherish such high deeds even in the bosom of our adversaries. I thank your grace for this high courtesy, which I shall give away immediately. But this remains, that we divide our power. Thou, son Joran, my cousin Westmoreland, towards York shalt bend you with your dearest speed, to meet Northumberland and the prelate's group, who, as we hear, are busily in arms. Myself and thou, son Harry, shall towards Wales, to meet with Glendower and Lord Mortimer. Rebellion in this land shall lose his sway, meeting the check of such another day. And since our business so fair is done, let us not leave to all our own be one. <laughs> Soft, whom have we here? Did you not tell me this fat man was dead? I did. I saw him dead, breathless and bleeding on the ground. Lives thou. There is Percy. If your father will do me the honour so, if not, let him kill the next Percy himself. Oh. <laughs> I look to be either Earl or Duke, I can assure you. <laughs> Why, Percy, I killed myself and saw thee dead. It's thou. Huh? Lord, Lord, how this world is given to lying. <laughs> I grant you I was down and out of breath, and so was he, but we both rose of an instant and fought this hour long by the Shrewsbury clock. If I be believed so, if not, let those that reward valour bear the sins upon their own heads. I take it upon my death. I gave him this wound in the thigh. Zoons and he were alive and would deny it, I would make him eat a piece of my sword. Oh. <laughs> This is the strangest tale that ever I heard. This is the strangest fellow, Brother John. Come. Bring your luggage nobly on your back. For my part, if a lie may do thee grace, I'll gild it with the happiest terms I have. I'll follow, as they say, for reward. He that rewards me, God reward him. If I do grow great, I'll grow less. For I will purge and leave sack and live cleanly as a nobleman should do. 